I'm not saying go and copy this or go and buy them tomorrow because I have lower purchase prices than what the current prices are on now. And then you'll see my watch list also to the right. So the companies I'm currently invested in my personal name is Sabanya, MTN, Purple Group, PayPal, and Grand Canyon Education. So although I've got three SA Inc. stocks, S Sabanya offers me the offshore exposure because they earn in revenue and they benefit from commodity prices. So if you remember what I explained about the dollar and the commodity prices, Sabanya is a beneficiary when commodities are, are, are high in price and the RAND is devaluing because they are earning more in local costs. So there's a natural hedge for buying quality miners. That's why I like Sabanya. But they are cyclical because they go through cycles. MTN Group, I'm a big fan. I've been buying them since about 44 Rand. And they have offshore exposure in the African markets, 280 million subscribers on their network. So just think of the potential, guys. If they get into fintech or mobile money payments, they've already got this big network. Now, Purple Group could contact MTN and say, hey, let's access that network. Let's form a joint venture. And similar what Capitec did with with Purple Group. MTN has got that goodwill that I spoke about, that brand value, the, the capture of their network. Now, you imagine mobile payments, fintech, endless possibilities there. And one of the stocks that grew during COVID was MTN because you need data for the internet. I'm just following the money, I'm following the trends. Purple Group, we know what they offer. They offer us access to the markets. I like them. Long-term, good play. PayPal, also again, FinTech. They currently valued at $300 billion, and I believe they're going to be a trillion-dollar company. Again, I'm invested because I earn income in them. More and more people are connecting PayPal. More and more people are going to start earning money online. Growth, unlimited. Grand Canyon Education. Again, I mentioned that I think education is recession-proof. The last cost a family member is going to cut, one of the last costs, is their child's education. I'm going to stop buying clothes so my son or daughter can still go to school. So education, I invested. Grand Canyon, they listed on the NASDAQ. I think they undervalued good qualities, their own universities. On the right, you'll see my watch list. I'm not going to go through them all. but you'll see that I've got Aframat, DRD Gold, JSC, Jubilee Metals, Lewis Group, which I took a position in yesterday. So they are actually top six shares now, no more on the watch list. Visa, I trade Visa. Apple, Twitter, I like Twitter because I'm a user of Twitter. They're trying to monetize their revenue streams, earn more money, they cash generative. I think they're overvalued, but they're on a watch list. So you can take a photo of those, those companies, guys. These are the companies I, I continuously watch, continuously research, and I ignore, I ignore all the other noise. So if someone starts speaking about Evgeng or something, the construction company, yeah, I might put on my research watch and do it, but I focus on my, my babies. So I ignore the noise. I stick to my strategy. When my target price is reached for one of these, I enter whether I'm going to trade it or long-term it. It's based on the strategy. I don't decide after I've bought, I decide before I buy. All right, and then I'm just going to show you, maybe most of you e use easy equities. I use easy equities. I used to use FNB Share Investor, but just like the tier, tier expenses, they were charging me 82 Rand a month just to have the account a flat rate of a hundred bucks just to buy any share, ridiculously expensive. I moved over to easy equities, cheaper rates, mobile friendly, found the stock, invested in the stock. 
something I just want to mention about Easy Equities, they're going to reach a threshold of how many customers join their network. And then for them to grow into their earnings, they have to justify what they value at now. They have to get more income from their existing base. So what are they going to do? They're going to increase the monthly fee. So maybe not just yet, but a year from now, maybe two, expect to pay a monthly fee. Probably we won't be too high, maybe 20 bucks, 25 Rand for premium service, 12 Rand for normal service. Because they're going to reach a threshold. Think about it, you're in an economy where people don't have money. So there's only an X amount of people investing. And they have to capture a certain percentage of that market. So when they get to the threshold, I don't know the number, they will look to ways to get more income from their existing clientele. And then I want to leave you with this quote, guys. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Benjamin Franklin. Invest in your knowledge, guys. Keep learning. There's a lot of free tools that are available to you. Twitter is an amazing resource. Connect with people that are sharing quality information. Ask questions. My DMs are always open. You have my email now. They're always open. Contact me. We can talk. I am in Thailand, so I'm five hours ahead. So if I take long to respond, I apologize for that. And then that concludes the seminar, guys. I'm going to open up Q&A. I can't promise I can answer all questions, but if I can't answer them, I will write it down and get back to you with an answer that I can, can actually trust to give you. So if there's any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. I'll, I'll keep the floor open for about 10 minutes. If you want to start leaving, no problem, guys. All right, Tozi, I'm glad to see you still here. You can unmute yourself, go ahead. Epic, man. Thanks so much for the session. Um, it really feels like we should be paying for this. So I really do appreciate what you kind of put us onto. So if I've got a couple of questions, but Maybe just to start with, right? All right. All right. Um, you mentioned the whole difference between a trader and an investor according to SARS, right? Yeah. And it's that three-year kind of period. Um, how, what, what, how do they kind of tax us differently? You, are you aware of how they may tax us differently between whether we're a trader or an investor? Okay. I, I do know a little bit, but it's best to maybe contact Andre on Twitter, ask him. If you are selling shares within a three-year period, then you consider it a trader. So all your capital gains is taxed at an income rate. So if you're earning a salary and you find yourself in the 18% bracket, 35% bracket, the capital appreciation on your trading within that three-year period gets added to your taxable income. Minus rebates, all that stuff. If you consider an investor, you're holding a stock for longer than three years and you sell it afterwards, then you have that 40 I think it's a 40,000 exclusion. So if you're not earning more than 40,000 40, in, in capital appreciation, then you don't have to worry about that. And then you tax at a different rate. I think it's, oh, I'm not sure the rate, but you'll have to check with Andre. Okay. Epic, epic. No, that's, so that seems like it makes more sense to be holding some things for a little bit longer time than depending on your risk portfolio as well. Um, sure. Just another two, two quick ones. Go for uh, it. Maybe one of the easier ones first. Um, crypto right now, you mentioned, was in that kind of high risk um, kind of zone that you mentioned. Do you feel like over time, maybe in five to 10 years, once we like see more of your traditional companies start to take it up, do you feel it would ever like reduce, maybe go into more of a medium risk kind of investment? Ah, uh, yes, that's a great question. I think crypto will, but it needs those that emerge winners will be into the medium. So at the moment, we have such a saturated market. If Bitcoin is the one that emerges a winner, then yes, it might drift into the medium term. But at the moment, it's up and down and we need to find that level and the level of acceptance. Epic. And then just the last one, then I'll um, open the floor up to everybody else. Maybe this is more of a trick one, and maybe I know exactly what the answer is, but you All mentioned right. like the focus on emergency fund right away, right? For sure. Um, and then 
I just wanted your thoughts maybe in terms of debt. So I've also got a little bit of debt, right? And there's a couple of schools of thought where if some people say, pay that debt up front. And, but like, I'm also seeing like, man, it feels like I'm maybe missing out on some of the dips. So I'm kind of trying to figure out if I should split up between paying off my debt and an emergency fund as well as investing in some things or what, if, if it was you, what would you kind of do, you know? Okay. So uh, there's this thing called opportunity cost. Like if I'm not investing, I'm missing out on the market. So if I have debt, personally, I would try and pay that off as aggressively as possible. The first thing you need to find out is the percentage you're being charged. So you can work out how much you're going to pay in the, lo- in the long term to pay that debt off, as long as you're not accumulating more. So if you've got that total in mind and you're willing to risk investing, thinking you can get more return than what you are going to pay back, then yes. So there's a thing that I do is sort of arbitrage trading. I borrow on my credit card in Thailand at a very low rate. And then I pay that off, but I send the money back to SA and I try and earn a higher rate. So at the same time, I might not be successful and pay the debt off. Can't pay the debt off. I might lose money, but I might also get a stock that pays more interest, more return capital appreciation than what I'm paying on my debt. So if you're willing to take that risk, then go for it. Personally, I would try and keep my debt very low. I'm not going to ask you how much it is, but just work out how much you're going to pay and then look at what your potential earning power is. Maybe you get lucky, you earn it, you pay the debt off and you've actually made money. So it depends on the person. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, David. Cool. No worries. Ricardo, I see your hands up. Yeah, hi, David. Um, sorry, a, I've got my, my question I wanted to ask was about the yeah. tax-free savings account, the TFSA. Yeah, yeah. And um, the 36,000 rand allowance per year. Yes. Uh, I think I read on one of your posts or, or a thread a few days ago, a few weeks ago, um, where I think you stated that you you prefer REITs as your preferred asset class for 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 that sort of tax free mm-hmm. savings account. Yeah. And I just I just wanted uh, to ask if you could elaborate on, on that. Okay. No problem. As to why you feel why, why you feel that is the case. Okay. So there is some risk to that, which depends on the economy. So obviously. I, I monitor that. So if the REITs are not going up in share price, then I'm losing value on my money. But the whole concept of a tax-free account is to earn tax-free income. So REITs pay out a large portion of their profits. That's how they get that REIT status. So they're going to continually pay out that over the long term. So as long as the share price isn't collapsing, and I continue to earn that tax-free income, over time, I should see exponential growth. So I'm trying to benefit from the tax-free account and earning. I'm not going to go and earn. um, In my personal tax-free account, I actually learned this from Warren Ingram. He talks about it. He's got an awesome podcast. He recommends not buying um, offshore um, ETFs that are are generating... um, dividends because you still pay tax on that dividends from the, the that sovereign state so you want to earn tax free income and having local payers pay you that you're going to benefit more from having that tax free but there's also the risk involved in that because if the REIT is going to go down based on the local economy the 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 profits that I'm getting is 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 not going to outweigh what I'm losing on capital and another nice. And another reason I invest in REITs is because owning property is, is you, there's a lot of logistics to it, a lot of headaches, managing tenants, managing the buildings, right? REITs, I'm exposed to property, but without the headaches. So the, that's my personal choice just to benefit from the tax. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I do have another question, but I Go think it's... It. Uh... I, th- I think it's beyond the scope of this seminar and question and ask okay. the type uh, back and forth. But 
but I, I, I do want to maybe get, get some feedback or your thoughts on this whole NASPIS and process yeah. uh, dealings that, that's been going on. Um, and really just wanted to kind of pick your brain on, on what you, if, if you, if you tracking it, if you've been, I, I, it, what, what your thoughts on the whole process is. So ideally I, I took a trade in NASPIS, but long-term, I think because the discount that they're trying to close the discount price, I'd rather just invest in 10 cent directly. NASPIS is basically a proxy to entering into 10 cent. So I'd rather just invest in 10 cents straight unless NASPERS can unbundle assets to bring down the NAV value to, to make it more in line with the, the share price. Then I will be interested in holding it long term. They tried to do that with process, unbundled it to sort out the NAV, the NAS, net asset value of the underlying business, but they still haven't succeeded. So it's still a strong company, lots of cash where they invest that cash to get a return in the future and how much appreciation does that company have still in the share price. So it, it's very tricky, but honestly, I would go straight 10 cents, then own NASPERS because at the moment it's yeah. just a proxy for that. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thanks. Cool. So Nele, we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would want to appreciate uh, um, this whole seminar. It was very um, uh, informative. Um, but I just wanted to know, <laughs> what do you think about crypto? About crypto? I, yes, I am still at, the, yes, 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 okay, about crypto. So... And the and, um, thing is, it's because I have absolutely no information about it. Yes, they is this talk on Twitter about it. But unfortunately, I feel like, especially these days, that um, there are so much tips. And I feel like, you know, getting into the train, but at, at the back of my mind, I'm, I'm like, because I don't understand this. So what, what, what do you think about crypto? And maybe my second question is around your, your watch list. Apart from doing your research, are you perhaps waiting for a dip in any of those stocks? Uh, or, um, you... <laughs> which, which, which stock have you so got in mind? <laughs> oh, you are seriously doing some, some you know, fundamental analysis on, on, those, on those stocks because there are a few that I'm, I think I'm handling um, already, but, uh, you know, with, with, with very little information or with very little fundamental analysis, because I'm one of those few people who just go on Twitter and, and listen to the hype and probably just dip <laughs> in. And maybe also to come in on the issue of emergency fund, um, it was, you know, I'm one of those people who actually dipped into my emergency funds and went on to the Sasol train back then. And uh, obviously it gave me a lot of, um, you know, um, interest and, you know, a lot of money. And it, sometimes you just need to, to weigh um, um, the pros and cons. And sometimes you um, you become very lucky, like, Have I lost you guys? Oh, there we yeah. go. We've come back. All right. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me get to your first question about crypto. Uh, very, very good question. Uh, I can't give a definite answer, but I'm going to give you a view based on someone that I follow. So there's a guy, you can write his name down. He's Harry Dent. Harry Dent. H-A-R-R-Y-D-E-N-T. Harry Dent. So he talks about the great deleveraging. And he uses another guy's example called Ray Dalio. I've shared a, a post about Ray Dalio. He's a head fund manager, very intelligent guy, but they talk about this deleveraging because the, the world economy is hooked on debt and we need debt to grow and interest rates are so low that we are in a credit bubble. So inflation hasn't come into the real economy, but it's gone into asset prices. So they believe for us to correct and to steer ourselves out of safety, we have to deleverage. 
So we basically have to eliminate money. Asset prices have to come from year to year. So crypto is not, not immune to this, although they might be the next thing or the next safety. When there's a deleveraging event and people sell out, every asset goes down because people are trying to get liquidity or they rush to cash. So to get to your crypto point, will cryptos succeed? Yes, definitely. We heading. I'm sharing a post about this tomorrow, about a cashless society. And I think it's the future. We'll probably use our phones for more payments. We'll be using less money. My friends in China haven't touched money for two years. So it's to get tracked. I won't talk too much about the freedom and things like that. But I think we'll go through this great deleveraging event like Harry talks about and a few others. Crypto will come down and that will be the opportunity of a lifetime to get the cryptos that are probably going to emerge winners. I'm sure Bitcoin will be like the reserve, like the dollar. It will become the reserve asset for cryptos. And you're going to want crypto, definitely. Which ones? I'm not 100% sure about. Bitcoin is a good guess for now but you can buy much later. So if you want to buy now, then you must be prepared to handle massive losses and also prepare to add more over time if you believe in it long-term. Now, I can't tell you if it's going to succeed and what that price will be, whether it gets to 65, maybe the true value will be 20,000. I don't know. I also see a situation where the world is not going to need the US dollar anymore because People want to get off it. And we're going to go, think of an ETF. An ETF is a basket of instruments with different companies. I think when we buy commodities, we won't use dollar anymore. It's called SDRs. So it's a basket of assets, pristine assets that will, will allow currencies to derive value. So it might be 10% gold, 10% Bitcoin, 50% dollar, 40% euro or 10% euro, sorry. It might be a basket of assets like an ETF. And then when you trade commodities and buy things, that will be the standard denominator to derive value from. So you're going to want assets like that, especially if Bitcoin is going to be part of that pristine value basket where we derive value from for all currencies to trade with each other. Uh, so... I think cryptos have a place. I think we move into a cashless society. First worlds will transition there a lot quickly because you can think of South Africa. A lot of us are unbanked. We deal with cash. People also use it for sneaky moves, tax evasion, cash jobs. Once that's gone, everything's cashless. You can get tracked. Banks can send you money when they need it and say, if you don't spend it in this time, we take it away. So they can stimulate economies like that. He has a thousand bucks, spend it by next week, Tuesday, otherwise you lose it. Cool, I'm going to go buy clothes, I'm boosting the economy. So they can control inflation. So currencies, yes. Cryptocurrencies definitely will come, I can't tell you which ones. To your second point, my watch list, Lewis now at 30 Rand. I shared a post today. I believe my stop loss is at 28 Rand. You'll see that I plotted the supports. So yes, Lewis, I'm in because I'm looking forward to my dividends next month this time. I'm willing to take a bit of risk. And I've looked at their balance sheet. The fundamentals are good. They have a lot of cash on hands. That's why they buy dividends. They too are also rebuying their shares. So when a company buys their shares, they, they considered themselves that their company is undervalued. So they are rewarding shareholders by doing that. Uh, Aframat, yes, excellent company. At the moment, wait for a massive pullback before you enter. Uh, someone shared a post today on Twitter. I can't remember who it was, but they showed the channel of Aframat. I'll share the post after this and you can go have a look. And Aframat's great. They export coal, healthy company, growing, good opportunity there. Twitter, yes, but wait for a pullback. Uh, yeah, the others I'm still doing research on. I have set prices. And yeah, it's hard to say go and buy this. I also don't want to say go and buy it. I don't want you to lose money. It's just, just my opinion. So don't go and please don't go and buy these companies. You can message me, ask me. I can spend some time looking at it and say, listen, Sanele, I think it's a good time. You can cost average in. That might protect you. 
And then to your third point, emergency fund. Uh, well played with Cecil. Nice one. That was a once in a lifetime opportunity. So like their perfect example, they just, they just say don't dip into emergency funds, but hey, we all adults, guys. If you're going to be responsible about it, then yes. And then if it goes wrong, you only have yourself to blame. So that's all I can say. It's up to you. Best thing to do is to actually try and preserve your emergency fund and then have a secondary fund. Um, call it an opportunity, opportunity fund. So when those dips come into hand, you've got the money and you don't need to go to your emergency. Because if you're faced with a situation where you've taken money out of your emergency fund and you're buying shares, an emergency comes up, but the share is 10% down, you're going to be forced to sell and realize a loss. And then that's going to be a, an ugly taste in your mouth. So you can take on debt and then try and outweigh the interest you're going to pay on debt and think that share could go up, but it could drop more. And now you have debt and now you question, should I sell? Should I have debt in my emergency? It can get ugly. So, yeah, <laughs> decision's yours. I wouldn't recommend it, but if the opportunity comes, you did well with Sassel, just balance your risk. That's it. That's all, all I can say.